20 and 10 by Claire Bishop, Chapter 2. Gold. There was just time for the Jewish children to get washed before the lunch bell rang, and it was, it was in the dining room that we saw them first. There were a few of them sitting at each table so that we could all have a chance of getting acquainted. As we filed in, Philip said, What's the fuss about? They look just like us. Nazis are crazy. What do I smell? chanted Henry, sniffing. Leek and potato soup. He smacked his lips and rubbed his stomach. My favorite. My, am I hungry. So am I, said George. I collapse, announced Philip, imitating a rag doll. I said, there is not nearly enough to eat with those ration cards. I wish it were like before. My older brother told me all about it. He said that before he had so much to eat that sometimes he could not finish. He actually left something on his plate. Don't make up stories, whined Denise, holding Louis by the hand. Louis started to jump up and down. I want to eat here, he pointed to his throat, up to here, just once. Just once. Quiet, said Henry impatiently, turning to us. Look at the bowls. What is the matter? There is even less than usual. Something is wrong. Children, called Sister Gabrielle as we reached our places. You probably have already noticed that there is less soup than usual in your bowls. Let me explain. We have ten new boys and girls. They have no ration cards. Can they get them tomorrow? asked Philip. No, said Sister Gabrielle. They cannot. They can never ask for ration cards, because if they do, Nazis will find out where they are. George said, How can they eat without ration cards? They will die, said Henry matter-of-factly. That's right, went on Sister Gabrielle. Unless we share with them our own ration cards, that is what we are doing today. That is why there is less soup for each one of us. From now on, the slogan is, We all eat or nobody eats. We sat down in the silence. We did not feel like talking. Soon we could tell by the very sound of the spoons that everybody was getting to the bottom of each bowl pretty quickly. Too quickly. Henry sat across the table from me. He was counting the spoonfuls and swallowing to make it last. Nine... Ten. He sighed, and I heard him mutter to himself, perhaps three more. He threw a glance at his new neighbor, who had already cleaned his bowl. He was a small, blonde boy, doubled up on the chair. He had large, dark circles under his eyes. What's your name? asked Henry in a low voice. Uh, uh, Arthur, said the boy. I am Henry. Look, Arthur, do me a favor. Eat the rest of my soup. Arthur shook his head vehemently. Henry crimped past his lips and said, Please, to tell you the truth, I hate this stuff. Quickly, I put a hand over my mouth. I was going to scream. Didn't I know how fond of that soup Henry was and what an appetite he had? Arthur's eyes became very large, as if he were about to cry. And before he could say a word, Henry had emptied his bowl and the other's and, breathing hard, had sat back in his chair, looking straight in front of him. I was speechless. Presently, Arthur finished the soup. Then I saw him fumble under, in his pocket and slip something into Henry's hand under the table. For you, he said. A woman gave it to me on the road last night. No, said Henry, and he too shook his head vehemently. Yes, Arthur went on. Can you guess what it is? I could tell that Henry was trying to feel under the table without looking. Suddenly, I saw his face relax and beam with pleasure. Thanks, pal, he said. Of course, I was dying with, of curiosity, and I was so glad that right after lunch, Henry came over to me in the yard and said, Now we are real Egyptians, aren't we? Is that why you gave Arthur your soup? I asked. How did you guess? Henry smiled. Oh, sneered Denise, who had overheard us. Henry just wants to show off. This morning, he was the one who tried to sell goods to the Holy Family, to sell. And now, did you by any chance get myrrh, frankincense, or gold in return for your soup? She mocked. Mind your own business, barked Henry. 
Anyway, you have no idea how I was going to end the game this morning if I had been free to do so. Besides, he stopped and seemed to make a big discovery. As a matter of fact, he went on slowly, I did get something back. Gold, pure gold. Oh, show us, show us, Denise and I both cried, but he would not. It was only in the evening, when it was already somewhat dark, that Henry made a sign for me to follow him. And there, behind a big tree, he showed me Arthur's gift. I put my two hands on my chest. It was a small piece of chocolate. We had not seen any for months and months, and surely Arthur had not either. It was a priceless gift. I could not possibly ask Henry to let me have a taste. Such a precious thing. And after all, it did belong to Henry. He had earned it. So my heart leapt when I heard him say, Wet your finger in your mouth. I knew right away what he was up to. I did it. Then he took hold of my wet finger and ran it back and forth, back and forth on the piece of chocolate. Suck your finger now, he said. I did. And I kept doing it for a long time after I had licked all the chocolate off of it. Henry bit off a piece of the chocolate about half the size of a pea and ate it. We did not speak. We were very quiet. Then Henry said, If we are careful, it will last a long time. He said, We. So it meant he was thinking to let me have another turn sometimes. But I did not let on at all for fear he might change his mind if I did. Yet I had to protest, protect our gold as much as possible. And I said, Henry, aren't you afraid it will melt in your pocket? Oh, I didn't think of it, said Henry. Of course, there is paper around it. Nevertheless, you are right. Besides, Sister Gabrielle might find it, and there will be all sorts of questions. I guess we'll have to eat it all right now. Never in your life, I said, gasping. It's a treasure. What about hiding it somewhere? A place only you and I will know. Right, said Henry. Come on quickly before anybody misses us. I know a place. We race behind the house. There the hill starts to go up abruptly. It's covered with thicket brush and is very stony. It is real wild country, and I would have been afraid there at twilight if Henry had not gone ahead. We came to the brook that trickles down the slope among the rocks and boulders. Henry stooped and bent over. He took out a slab of rock from the side of the bank. This left a clean, cool, sandy hole. In it, we laid the piece of chocolate. We closed the safe again on the slab. I whispered, how are we ever going to find it again? Look, said Henry, it just faces that triangular stone in midstream. Henry, I promised, I will never come here without you. After that, we ran back as fast as we could. But all of a sudden, Henry grasped my wrist and I stood still. As I did so, I heard a noise such as we had made when our feet kicked the stone while we ran. Only this time, we were not making it. Then it died out and we went on down, Henry not letting go of my hand. Back in the schoolyard, as we were, just, as we were going into the house, I asked softly, What was that? Perhaps just the echo of our own footsteps? No, whispered Henry, slowly shaking his head. I think it was somebody.